Mike, I know that there are people who are wondering, why are you back? You're back after eight weeks. I didn't think so much could happen in a year. I didn't think so much could happen in a month. So much has happened just every 24 hours. It seems like a lifetime. When I spoke to you eight weeks ago, and, and I just want to emphasize to people who are on there that this is the biggest, the most subscribed call that I've yet had like this, that there are over 350 people who have signed up now, not for me, Mike, but for Mike Milken, for you. They want to know what's going to happen in urban America. They want to make a difference. They want to know about vaccines and treatments for COVID-19, and they really want to know what's going to happen in the economy. So, Mike, and, and I do prepare now. I'm not an optimist, and you are. I'm very afraid of what's going on right now. I've been to the protests here in Los Angeles, and yet you still believe that our best days are ahead of us. Why are you so optimistic for the future? I am more optimistic today, Frank, than I was eight weeks ago. Those young protesters remind me of myself. It was 1965, the Watts riots that I spoke to you about that changed my life. I was 19. I wanted to go see what was happening. Why was Los Angeles on fire? I had to wait till the next day uh, because my dad told me if I walked out that door, he hoped I inherited a lot of money because I would never get a cent. But I identify with those young people. And one reason I am more optimistic and I is I have more hope from that standpoint. Many years so, ago, Frank, we started, you're talking now 35 years, our Educator Award in America to surprise teachers, to increase how teachers felt about themselves, their self-esteem, uh, to let kids see that newspapers and television cameras came into a school for a teacher, not anyone else. And this day, I was in a school, and the winner, and these are all surprises, the winner got this award because she had reduced teen pregnancy more than anyone else. And she was in an urban area, very poor, but she had reduced teen pregnancy. And they asked her, how did you do it? And she said, I found the world's greatest contraceptive. And now they wanted to know what was it? Everyone was asking him, what was it? Hope. It was hope. Hope of a better life. Hope of opportunity, etc. And I think these marches are re rekindling things that should have been, and that's hope. For me, it's raw. I thought we solved most of these problems beginning in 1965. By the late 1980s and early 90s, almost every major city in America had an African-American mayor. Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, D.C., Detroit, Atlanta, etc. And when I spoke to the mayors at the African-American Mayor Association, one of the things I discovered, Frank, what you're going to see here today, we're going to find a solution to, is they had political power but didn't have economic power. All their pension funds could not buy the debt because they were limited on rating of one company that was headed by an African-American. So they had redlined themselves. So even though there was political power, they needed economic power. Hope opportunity. Why am I optimistic? Every single person now understands that that checker in a grocery store has an important job. The person that's delivering packages to your house has an important job. The concern about minimum wage and what was a living wage, that is going to change because all these jobs that people didn't think were important turned out to be very, very 
So it's hard not to be optimistic when we recognize the majority of people have a whole different view as to what an important job is. Who so risked Mike, their life? Who took chances so that you could have a normal life? So I want to ask you specifically, and on several of these calls, I've talked about the students at Verbum Day. It's one of the greatest experiences I've had, South Central LA. These kids come from very difficult backgrounds and they succeed in high school and many of them go to college and many of them have great lives, but they wonder now, because they haven't been in school for months, because they see the world around them, they see the protests, and they see that life, they don't know what's in store for them. So I want you to, as though I were African-American or Latino, and I'm graduating from high school, and I haven't been in a classroom in two or three months, and I don't know what the future holds. What do you say to me to tell me about my future in a country that is so divided, so polarized, and seemingly at war with itself. Transitions occur in these periods of time. And I, when I will say to them, their chances today are better than ever. We have to find an economic solution so you're not in debt for the rest of your life if you want to go to school. Many years ago, Gene Lang offered, I have a dream. Started with kids, I believe, in second grade. And if you could meet up to your obligations of going to school, graduating, someone would pay for your education. It is my belief that we are going to find models now that not only pay for your college education, but pay for your education in life. The idea that I have lived with my entire life, that my children and grandchildren can have a great life if a kid in South Central doesn't think he has a chance. That is not possible. We adopted all the elementary schools in a group of 10 program in South Central, Frank. 10 schools, over a thousand kids in elementary school. The teachers got paid more. The principals got paid more. The schools were open early, stayed open late, and ran 10 and a half months a year. Those kids got a great education. Unfortunately, that program was canceled. But every single person is asking themselves, could I have done more? And I'm not going to stay back. Education is essential for every one of those kids okay, that but you are I interacting with. But Mike, hold on. And this is something that, that pains me to ask this and to comment on this, but there is a difference if you are white or black in this country or brown in this country. There is a difference in the schools. There's a difference in the hospitals. There's a difference in housing. I may not have acknowledged this 10 years ago, but I acknowledge it today. What are we going to do? Not the statistics. What are we gonna to do to solve those differences? Okay, well, let's start. That group of 10 schools that operated for a decade had the best principals and the best teachers. So if you're starting farther behind the starting line, we're going to have to find a way that the best teachers and the best principals go to those schools. And whether it's pay or whether it's inside of them that they're going to dedicate themselves to it. So I see this as awakening, Frank, an awakening that we will not have a country that's together unless every single person has a chance. And that goes the same on housing. So there's a lot of things coming together. Interest rates are so low today that there are solutions for housing that we have not brought. There are some simple answers. When you realize it cost our country $1 trillion, that's financial, a month, the damage that's occurring and the psychological damage that's occurring to families dwarfs that. The challenges we're going to have in mental health, the collateral damage of cancer and other diseases. We have to find solutions. And one of those solutions you've seen as the U.S. government has decided it will put up money for medicines they don't know if they're going to work. 
So whether it's Moderna's vaccine, whether it's Oxford University's vaccine, or whether it's Johnson & Johnson, or whether it's Gilead, they're putting up money before they know if something works. That money is in the billions. To energize the minority banks in this country, the minority depository institutions, there's only like 140 of them, would take hundreds of millions, not hundreds of billions. If we can get money into those institutions and increase their capital, they are much more likely to provide loans and opportunities for people in their community. When you look at these groups, like the minority depository institutions, 60% of their depositories, people that deposit money, are from lower income minorities. 60% of their borrowers. If you go to the traditional banks that everyone's familiar with, only 20%. There is a way today to get capital into these communities and get people involved. Just Some in the last few days, Frank, PayPal announced they're going to invest five to six hundred million dollars to support these financials the technology of paypal could empower many of our minority led institutions so once we have recalibrated the cost to our society we decided we can invest over a billion to produce the oxford university vaccine that small billion dollars relative to the cost to our society. And I think we now, everyone fully understands the cost to our society of not investing in these minority banks and other organizations is far greater than we think. And that is our risk. And that is our risk to our country. So I'm being, I've never had this many questions. I've never had this many people on a call. I've never had this many questions. And I want to do one more on the social fabric of the country. And I'm now acknowledging because I got no fear anymore. I'm reading. I've prepared these questions for you. Not just in the black communities, not just in the brown communities, but in poor white communities that are being forgotten. The people who live in Kentucky and Tennessee and West Virginia who have no government programs. They have no one marching for them, no one protesting for them. How do we address income inequality in this country, recognizing that you and I have done okay, but these people have no chance and they don't, they do not have hope. And I now I'm taking away the racial component because there are millions of Americans, white Americans, who don't see that they've got a future, they didn't get educated, and now they're struggling. Income inequality, how do we address it, Mike? I think I've started to address that already today, Frank. How about the person that picked up the groceries and delivered them to your house? No matter whether they're Caucasian, African-American, Hispanic, Asian, that person needs to get paid more. And I think every company is now reevaluating what is going to be the status for their company and for their employees and recognizing that every person is unique and every person is important to our society. In West Virginia and other parts that were coal country, coal is not coming back. It was a way of life for generation and generation. Free education and opportunity, job training, et cetera, we're going to have to make that investment. Uh, we have a rich country. And in my opinion, if we do not make these investments in a democracy, we don't know necessarily what the country is going to look like. So you, myself, and every single other person, I can tell you this. Our class in Harlem in 1988 and 89 at A. Philip Randolph High School, the first group of our Milken scholars, they're 47 and 48 years old today. Out of our 500 scholars, 498 undergraduate degrees from the lowest social economic groups, 
498. Half of them have graduate degrees. They are positive members of our society. And whether they're Caucasian, African-American, Hispanic, they came from the lowest social economic. Senator Scott, former governor of Florida, senator from Florida, ran one of the largest hospital systems, never knew his dad, lived in a trailer or public housing with his mother and family. Okay, there are many people, whether they're in West Virginia, Southern Illinois, okay, struggling, parts of Kentucky. They are all Americans that we are all one. Okay, many Mike. of their parents fought in World War II and gave their life so you and I can freely speak today. And I think this crisis, the marching and the medical, has helped let's everyone reevaluate what is important in life. And I am optimistic that we will be making the right decisions in the next six months. So let me let me go back to the questions. The first ones I'm gonna do two in a row. John Thomas wants to know what's the best advice for a public company CEO to have a short-term impact as they try to bring about long-term change in terms of our social inequality. And one more from Lorraine Spurge, which is that every company should identify someone, human resources should do it, in the mailroom, the receptionist, who can we can identify their inner talents and give them greater opportunity. We have so much money on this call. We have so many CEOs and private equity and hedge fund. What can they do right now so they have an impact before we get to December 31st? Okay, I think we want to recalibrate for one second, Frank. Okay. The United States is the most generous nation in the world. 400 billion in philanthropy. But the giving of your own time, if you price that out, dwarfs that. Give of your own time, mentor another person. What have we learned in 55 years? What I learned was if an African American owned the company, they were more likely to hire African Americans. If a person from Latin American ancestry owned the company, they were more likely to hire people from Latin America. Same with Asians, same with women, same with Native Americans. So getting people into jobs that look like America will hire more people and give more opportunities. But every single person can mentor, just like you and I are speaking today. We could talk to someone and FaceTime them on a cell phone. You know, Maya Angelou, one of her quotes, maybe the best that I ever, and that's going along saying was, what did they say? What did she say? They will forget what you said. They might forget what you did, but they will never forget how you feel. Camden, New Jersey, when I lived in Southern New Jersey, was a demilitarized zone. It is a totally different city today. The police chief and 22 members of the police force were out there marching with the community. It's a safe place to live today. Things change, leadership changes. At one time, people thought you're just gonna pave over Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey is a symbol for what can happen for every city in this country. I also want to, we're going to move to Mentor. Some people are concerned about food security. Make sure people have access to food. Some people are concerned about health. If they get this virus, is it going to bankrupt them? Who's going to pay their bills? How is it going to operate? So as you start to think about what do people need, they need shelter. They need housing. They need access to health care. They need some financial security to know that they're safe. All of those things can be provided, but create a job and create job training and create upward mobility so they don't just come to work for you, 
you're trying to give them a career with upward mobility. I want to recognize Michelle Jordan. Her comment was start the pipeline even earlier, looking for minority interns who are not the kids of CEOs, friends. I also want one more question on, on social justice, and then we're going to move to healthcare because everybody wants to know what's going on. Ambassador Frank Baxter, he says education is the most important variable impacting achievement gap, yet most systems are locked into one size fits all. How do we change our education system when the, I'm going to call it out, when the teachers unions resist performance pay for the best teachers, when they resist giving parents the right to send their children to schools that work? How do we make the change when parents cannot afford to send their kids to schools that either I've taught at or your kids got to go? How do we change that, Mike? I would say the kids that are most disadvantaged, we have to give them the best teachers and the principals. We have to raise the standards. We need to pay the teachers and the principals more that work in those schools. We've just lived through virtual education for two to three months. Let's do everything we can to give them access over the next two to three months to try to pick this up. I brought, and as you know, Frank, Mike's Math Club, you know, many years ago. And what was the challenge in Mike's Math Club? You might be with a child in the inner city. You might be with that child for two hours in your life? Can you change their life forever? Can you give them self-esteem? Can you give them some super mathematical powers that every kid now has to reevaluate? So we searched out the weakest kids, the ones that other kids thought were not smart. We gave them powers. They could multiply two digit numbers in their head. Their classmates question it, but as the thing unfolded, their whole image changed in two hours with their classmates. We have to let people know there is hope that someone cares about their success. You give people hope, you will change the world. Okay, we've got 300 people on this call, Mike, and I'm asking every one of them, and I recognize virtually every name here, you can mentor, you can give two hours a week and go back into the classroom and actually repeat and repeat and repeat because that mentoring matters so much to these kids to know that someone actually gives a damn about them and will go back and will be part of their lives. So I'm asking you all to do that. Mike, we got to turn to healthcare. Sonny Sassoon I just is want to asking. If I could, Frank, just one more thing. Walmart has more than a million employees. Amazon has more than 700,000. Kroger's got a half a million. Target's got 400,000. There might be 350 to 400,000 in Home Depot. These are great companies with great leadership. They can easily make the decision. And when you said before, Frank, it's quite possible the CEO can't hire. Let's get African-Americans and let's get Latinos and let's get others into HR, okay? Let them focus on who has that ability. But let's reach out to the community today and have them help themselves, okay? And I, I just can't stress that when you engage with a group, when you're done, you want to give them hope. You didn't come there for this hour. Okay, you came there to stay and you're going to build an infrastructure. I have done 73 podcasts in the last few months. One of the very first ones was Alex Gorsky. What did he do with J&J? &J? His nurses and doctors, he gave them 14 weeks, 14 weeks with pay to go help out in the healthcare system. Frank, many, many years ago, there was something that was started called DARE. Yep. Okay. And many, many people thought 
that Dare's sole purpose was to get kids off drugs. To me, and we were involved at this time, there was another purpose almost as important. And that was for a policeman to see humanity, not feel he's always being called in when there's some disaster or something terrible has happened. All the kids only saw the policeman in a negative light. Now you have the policeman coming into the classrooms and assigned for nine months or a year to a school. They changed. How they viewed the world changed. And when I saw the little kids run up and hug the policemen that had been coming to their elementary school for six months or a year, it had to change them. They need Mike, sensitivity training. Mike, right now, these same kids, you know this. I wasn't going to go here. But these kids are afraid of the cops. These kids hate the cops. These kids see them take away their fathers or their brothers. And so there, are, there aren't the African-American men in these communities. It's not as bad in the Latino community, but it's not great. We are now at our worst situation where we have people all across the country marching to defund the police. How are we going to get over that? My view is obviously you need sensitivity training and many changes, but you also need a policeman to see the positive parts of life not just the negative parts. And that was the benefit of D.A.R.E. And we need to get back to community policing where you know the kids and you know the families and they know the policemen. It isn't somebody coming into their neighborhood in a police car. And so D.A.R.E. served a very important purpose, in my opinion, Frank, and that was to sensitize and create a relationship between the policemen and little kids and high school kids, et cetera, that was different than the normal relationship. And if, if it was needed then, it is needed now. Okay, one more before we go to healthcare. You and I have discussed the role of economic freedom. You and I have presented all over the world about the values that economic freedom instills in people and the benefits that it gives to society. And yet right now you mentioned, I'm using companies you mentioned, Target was a target of looters, of rioters, to do as much damage as they could to those stores and take whatever they wanted. Amazon is a target right now by some people who tried to close it because Amazon is not unionized. How do we explain to the public, and that you and we've not talked about this, how do we communicate to the public that these companies like J&J &J and pharmaceutical companies, the negativity towards the pharmaceutical industry is so great, even though we are depending on them. And the number one question I've asked is, when are we going to get treatment and when are we going to get a vaccine? The same people who condemn pharmaceutical companies are the same people who are begging them to save our country and to save our world. How do we put that together? How do we get people to see that these companies are not evil? I think, Frank, let's go to your pharmaceutical bioscience industry. That might have been the feeling in January. I don't think it's the feeling today. There has never been an industry that has changed in cooperation. Competition is part of life. They are not competing with another with each other on a solution here. They've opened their patent libraries. They're offering to give it free. They've diverted their talent. Okay, I have never seen the cooperation that exists today across every line. People that worked on cancer are going through and trying to figure out what holds there to solve the problem of this virus. So I don't see that today. And when Johnson & Johnson says they're giving it free, okay, and they're, they and Barter are putting up a billion dollars, they've sent a message here. And so my, my opinion is, it's how do you operate in a crisis that we're going to judge? Not when things are great. 
Amazon margins have been reduced to make sure they are providing a lifeline to every single person. So communication is very difficult in a crisis. But oh, what's but going is... on in bioscience, we now realize at every level how dependent we are on them. Not only for food, for water, for safety, but for the quality of our lives. And I think Walmart is attuned, the leadership of every one of those companies. Let's just assume they were breaking their windows and it was not personal. It was rage. And they just happened to be there. Are they going to turn around the leadership of these companies and, and be bitter? No. Every single one of them now is trying to figure out what can they do? Can they create more jobs? Can they create more hope? Can they create some upward mobility? And I think we, well, we used to say when we thought about financial, we've never had something that cost a trillion a month. Money is relative here. Lives are being destroyed and they might be destroyed forever, not just those that got the virus. And so the stakes are too high. And what I see is almost every CEO is attempting to communicate with a message, I didn't do enough. I but Mike, my, my hold on. But I didn't do enough. I've seen, the, I've seen the polling data. You know that I work for CNBC, so I get a chance to take a look at what they do and what they ask. And I say this about cable news, including a channel that you help create, a channel that is global, and they cannot do enough bashing of CEOs that when the president brought them to Washington and each one of them got up and said what they were doing, the difference they were making, the commitments that they were offering and the promises that CEOs had not done, that that network went out of their way to bash those people. We have got, you would be so proud. I don't know if you can see the chat that's going on right now, but there's so many people who are on this call who are either committing to mentoring committing to making a difference, talking about the programs that they are doing exactly as you would want them. But what the hell are you supposed to do? And I've never done an interview like this. What the hell are we supposed to do when that network that is seen by millions and millions of people across the country bashes these corporations, bashes these CEOs, not only gives them no credit, but holds them responsible and accountable for the reason why there's so much rage. Frank, uh, one of the things you learn in philanthropy and I learned 50 years ago is no good deed goes unpunished. Okay, many of these networks in the short run, negative news gets some more viewers. It's someone's fault. This fall, we're going to see that it was China's fault, whether you're a Democrat or whether a Republican, it's going to be China's fault. It get it will occur. Maybe it'll end after the election. But I would say to you, none of these CEOs I know are going to stop trying to do what they're doing because somebody is bashing them. I mean, can you imagine? I have a business. And now I'm going to, anyone who thinks they have the coronavirus, please come to my parking lot. Okay. Now, how do you feel as a customer? Those who have the virus are coming here. I mean, I assure you, people running that business said, please have the testing across the street. They put them in their parking lots. Okay. People are committed. When you say, how can I be optimistic? Everyone who thought they did everything is now saying to themselves, I didn't do enough. They're ready to do more. And I think the realization that every life is important. Black lives are important. Latin American lives are important. But every American is important. Who is thanking that person who works in a grocery store? Policemen are thanking them. Firemen are thanking them. We are all should be thanking them. 
so we have food security. And I will never, ever look at a checker and a grocery store the same as I did before the coronavirus, ever. I, I want you to know that I told I warned you. God damn it. This is embarrassing. Every time an Amazon it's truck goes by. It's embarrassing to cry. It is. It's not. You care. Every time I see someone from UPS, every time I see an Amazon truck, every time I see one of these goes, God damn it. Every time I see them go by, I wave. And how did you feel? And this is my point, Frank. How did you feel in January? You didn't think their job was as important in January as it is today. And I said to you, when we offered the minimum wage support, you have people coming to work, risking their lives, who could have paid, made more money had they not come to work. And I think we look at these, and this is why I'm optimistic. I don't believe anyone, anyone can look again differently uh, against these workers. Their job was important, and they were there. They were there for us, and we need to be there for them. And if they need help going to school, then we're going to pay for them to go to school. We can afford it. And I think our universities are going to have to rethink their compensation model uh, for these students. Okay. I keep wanting to go on and I'm going to be begging you to give me an extra five or 10 minutes at the end because I want to get to the cures. But that Mick M is Mick Mulvaney, former White House chief of staff. And I want to read his exact comment. Keep in mind that for a group of people, the comment that was just made that all lives matter, which is what we all believe, that to some people that's hate speech. How do we change the tenor of the conversation so we can debate these issues openly? To all of us here, Mike, we agree with you. But if we were to say that on CNN, we would be blasted by commentators who are paid by CNN for hate speech. For an hour and a half yesterday, I spoke to Hawk, the head of Black Lives Matter in New York City. I fully understand how he sees the world. Okay, and during this period of time when emotions are raw, his view is Black Lives Matter. Okay, no one cared about him, no one supported him. I think three months from now, we might decide that everyone's lives matters. But today, we're very focused on Black Lives Matter. And when you're in a room again with an African American, you should feel how they feel. Okay. And for me, I dedicated my life to this. I thought Reg Lewis was the message, the Jackie Robinson for African Americans. We went around and visited high schools. We told them they could be Reg Lewis. We talked to kids throughout the country. We interacted with 100 black men. So that was the 1980s. They led their cities. They were the mayors. They were the leaders. But we obviously didn't do enough. Okay, let's just accept that. And my view on solutions are we didn't do enough whatever we were doing. And if 40% of Americans are fearful at night that they might get sick and get don't have the money to pay for their medical bills, then we need to rethink what we're doing at this time. I believe okay. there is an opportunity today that there wasn't in January. And we need to take advantage of that opportunity. And I believe no matter whether you get blamed for what you're trying to do or slammed, as you said it, that doesn't mean if it's right, you shouldn't be doing it. Okay, Mike, you have you are right in the center of treatments. You're right in the center of vaccinations. Your faster cures has made an impact and we see it today. So I got several questions on this. Sonny Sassoon asked why, and several people, 
why are we seeing a spike? And it's not in a few places. It's happening now over the last 48 hours. It seems to be happening in half the country. We are seeing a spike in infections. What's happening? Well, as you increase testing, you're going to see, I, I'm not focused on the spike. I'm focused on how many people are in the ICU, how many people in the hospital. We have to assume that the vast majority of people that had this virus didn't even know they had this virus. And so now as you increase testing, you're going to find most more people are going to be tested and you're going to have more. But how many are going to the minute to the hospital and how many are in the ICU? We know how to treat, treat the patients substantially better today than we did in February or March or April and May. And so it's my feeling that lower and lower percentage of the people will be going into the hospital. And if there's anything, in my opinion, that is not being reported accurately, it's what the advancements are in healthcare right now. So Johnson & Johnson was going to put its vaccine into humans in January 2020. It's going in this month and next month. Moderna, you mean January 2021? You mean January yeah, 2021? 21. Now it's June and July. Oxford University and Moderna, hundreds of millions of doses in September, October. Hopefully they work. Antivirals. And we have looked at, since I spoke to you in April, at a whole new thing that's occurred when we said, okay, why are more men dying than women from this? What role does testosterone pay, play in it? And we discovered in Italy, very few people on androgen deprivation therapy, ADT, ever died of the virus. Four were identified out of 21,000 men that died. And so it's possible that by suppression of testosterone for 30 to 40 days, it's possible that it cannot go into your lungs and you won't die. Okay, it's now in clinical trials at six or eight locations. And we will know in July of just a simple shot. Uh, this is for men only, unfortunately. But a simple shot, if you get the virus, will prevent it from going to your lungs. And so this and three or 400 other therapies are moving along today. And so when we everyone says, well, gosh, there's going to be a spike in the fall, I don't know. There might be a spike, but the virus might not damage you. So it might be the flu. So first is testing. Okay, we're going to identify more people with the virus. Let's assume some percentage of America, if it was 8% of America or 10, then 30 million people had this not to 30 million. So now that we have the test, we're going to do a much better job of identifying it. And we so have- Mike, the, no. So Mike, no. So I, I am optimistic about the medical solution, Frank. So I want to go, because I've been asked by so many people, I'm not going to ask you when the vaccination will be, because I know you think it's coming sooner rather than later. I am going to ask you a very serious, difficult, moral and ethical question. When they start to make these vaccines, and Johnson Johnson has often has offered to give it away for free, as you mentioned, it takes a certain amount of time to actually get them to people. How are we going to decide whether the U.S. gets the vaccines or whether it goes to Europe? How are we going to decide who in the U.S. gets the vaccines? Isn't that going to cause another division in American society? Who gets to be safe? First, Frank, your government, the United States government under BARDA, made the decision to put up billions of dollars so that that isn't an issue. Hundreds of millions of vaccines. Why did the U.S. put up a billion or a billion and a quarter for the Oxford university vaccine. I promise you there's a discussion will be made available to Americans. They were talking about 30 million doses in the UK. 
the technology that's available today, you're going to produce hundreds of millions. This isn't the technology of a vaccine from the 1950s. As Johnson & Johnson and Alex Gorsky pointed out, they have a new technology to make vaccines. So I actually don't believe that's the issue. Do you want to volunteer today to be one of the individuals that the vaccine is going into? And whereas I say, I don't see the competition of who's first. Everyone is rooting for everyone. I do believe China, who's got three vaccines, two heavily into humans, wants to be first. I believe Russia wants to be first. China's putting out advertising. I called the people putting these vaccines into humans and asked them, do you want help in recruiting patients or people? They said, Mike, no, we don't need it. We don't need Mike, help. would you be, would you accept right now a vaccine from a Chinese doctor? Would you be willing to be part of a Chinese test right now? They don't need me. They have enough people. Would I be willing no. to take the Moderna vaccine? Probably yes. But it's quite possible, Frank, because I've been on ADT therapy for 27 years that I am immune because of that. So I would hope in July I'll have an answer. Not just me, but everyone will start to understand whether this prevents this from going to your lungs. I want to ask uh, Daniel Siegel comes up with a great question. What are we going to do if this anti-vaccine segment of society that I would expect is not on this call, but you know that they're out there and you know that their information is spread on the web, what happens if they refuse? And I will say, and again, I'm surprised that I'm saying it now, I look at these protesters in places like Chicago and Michigan and Atlanta, protesters who won't wear masks. And I'm not talking about the Black Lives Matter protests. I'm talking about the protests of people who want to open up. They are potentially infecting people by their behavior, the refusal to wear masks, the fights that you see when they enter into stores and they're not covered up. What are we going to do as a society if we've got millions of people who refuse to take the vaccine? Well, if you have a vaccine that works, Frank, it's not going to affect you. So let's talk about what's actually happened. So in the UC system in the last few days, there's been a surge of patients. And when I say a surge, I say 50 people. It's not at UC San Francisco. It's not at Davis. It's not at UCLA. It's not in San Diego. It's not in Riverside. Where is it? They have the most number of patients, 50 that came in in Irvine. Well, you had Mother's Day, you had Memorial Day. And if you saw those pictures in Orange County of the beaches, okay, you, you would have to fight to get a spot at the beach. And in addition to that, you've had a lot of marches. So those series of events, we have to assume, substantially increase the number of people. But if you're vaccinated, the fact that someone else has chosen not to be vaccinated means you're still not going to affect you. Them and society, it will affect. But I would say to you, Frank, we have to assume that the antivirals, the antibodies and serum going into people, and the immunology efforts are going to come before the vaccine. But I do believe this issue that many people are worried about, who's going to get it? I believe our country has made that investment for the citizens so that that is not the issue. So I got a question from Dave Berwick. Should the average person on this call get in line and volunteer to be among those people who are the first to test the vaccine? Are you that confident? If it's Moderna or if it's Johnson & Johnson, is it safe for them to do this? Well, uh, the Moderna vaccine went into human beings on March 16th. So we're almost, you know, three months later, Frank. 
right now they have more than enough people lined up to get it. So it depends how you living your life, what you want to do. One of the problems you understand with a vaccine is you have to get around people that have the virus to find out whether the vaccine is working. So if no one is being diagnosed, uh, you're not going to find out. So those that have been uh, receiving the vaccine have to go in those environments. Those that have received the antibody. And as you and I discussed, if I was rooting, I'd like all of them to be successful. But if Moderna is successful, it is a game changer. It's a messenger RNA that's gone in. It's a different kind of vaccine. And it tells your body how to make the antibodies you need. If this works, then this technology should work in the future for every single virus that will tell your body to make the antibody against it. But hundreds and hundreds of companies are trying to find the solution. And I would just say the fact that more people are getting the virus or we're discovering them does not mean, I, I need to know how many are having to go to the hospital, what is their treatment, and in what condition are they in? And I do like the idea, the phrase, when you said that we're all rooting for everybody, for the first time that I can remember in my lifetime, if you use the words, we're all in this together, you actually mean it. It's for real. It's not a slogan. It's reality. In the remaining time we have, you're a financial genius. Can you explain to me, and you didn't do this eight weeks ago, and now you got to do it. Why is it that our stock market, with all this unemployment, with all this debt that we've now basically saddled on the next generation, how the heck is the stock market holding up so well? The trillions and trillions of dollars around the world, Frank, I would say there's two things happening. One, there's a desire to invest in America. And whereas we uh, are concerned and rightly concerned and are underlining the importance of Black Lives Matter, people around the world would prefer to invest in America. So the first element is what are they going to invest in? Are they going to invest in a government bond that yields less than 1% or are they going to buy stock in a company here? And that, so driving interest rates down drives people into the stock market or other alternative investments. Number two, if I'm a pension fund and have a 7% actual assumption, I need to make 7%. I cannot make it in a 10-year government bond at 75 basis points. So I need to find something else to invest in, whether I'm a foundation, whether I'm an endowment, okay, whether I'm a pension fund. Each of these are challenging me to find a right of return. The most liquid market in the world is the United States. So I have liquidity. I can buy and I can sell. The stock market went down $10 trillion. It then went up $20 trillion around the world. And on yesterday, it went down a few trillion dollars. So there is volatility. So I have to make a decision to invest in something. And so that is a decision being made around the world every day today. And that and so a lot of times you have a person that has a different outlook. You asked me at the beginning, Frank, how can I be optimistic? I have no other choice but to be optimistic. By the end of June, I will have invested 2,000 hours just working on medical. And I'm just one of millions of people and I'm not in the laboratories. Okay. I have too much faith in science to say we're not going to find a solution. So I am optimistic. So, and Mike, let me reach you. Oh. In the marketplace, new companies, new ideas are fostered out of this. And I am optimistic that we will get money into these minority deposit institutions and they will find a way to get 
money into these underserved communities throughout this country. I want to read you another great comment, Larry Herbst. I put some money back into the market for my psychological health. Despite my pessimism, I felt bad betting against this country. If it goes up, I can cheer. If it goes down, I rejoice, and I only put a small amount into the game. At the end of this year, two questions, two, this comes from two different people. The end of this year, is it going to be higher than it is right now or lower than it is right now? I don't know. How about unchanged? But I think my okay. comment is you can invest in companies you believe in. If PayPal is going to make a decision to figure out how to support small merchants and individuals, you can decide you like what they stand for. And so you're not just investing in the market. In this century, the 21st century, a company has to stand for something. Where do you stand? And I think we saw where the country stood when it saw the video of what happened to this man in Minneapolis. The country stands there. Big business stands there, et cetera. And we might not feel the pain that others have felt. We might not have felt the discrimination that others have felt. But that video, we fully understand what happened. And we feel that pain and we feel that pain for our country. And so my comment to you is, are you going to sit and moan and do nothing? Or are you going to figure out what to do? Can you find one person that you can give hope to, okay? And if we started there and everyone took an individual group of individuals, you've taken this group of kids from South Central LA and it's changed your life and you've seen the world through their eyes. And Don't they, do this. okay, and they can believe in you, Frank. They can trust you, okay? We need trust. We need to know that we're not there on Saturday and Sunday, okay? And, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll be by on Friday, but we're there every day. And we need to understand America had the highest percentage of any developed country in the world of people with a net worth under 10,000. It's not going to work unless we create opportunities for everyone. And I feel... This sequence of events, this sequence of events has told all of us we need to be all in. We need to be all in on giving people opportunity, giving people hope, okay? We need to protect our country. And when I think and I read about my parents' generation who lived through the Depression and lived through World War II, and left their family for three or four years, okay? And then when they got back, then they had the Korean War, okay? What they sacrificed for us to protect us and our freedom, we have the ability here, and that is what this year is crying out for, okay? Okay, That's Mike. asking for, Frank. They want I'm gonna all ask of us to be all in. I, I know I should end it now. I know that I'm supposed to end it from a time standpoint. I'm supposed to end it from a strategy standpoint. I've, I've done television. Mike, please, can I do three more with you? And I promise you, they're all about the future and they all matter to people on this call. Can I get five more minutes? Of course, and, and everyone should notice how healthy it was for you, Frank. <laughs> right, you had to well, be this shocked into taking care of yourself. And we've had a shock in this country. We've had a shock in this country and we need to respond. Okay, three questions and then we're done, I promise you. And they're all about the future. Mark Goldman wants to know what we're gonna do about the debt. I know you're gonna tell me that it's low interest or no interest, but we are saddling the next generation. They're gonna have to pay for this. And there are a lot of people on this call in their 20s and 30s that wonder, because we're going to have one more vote. I'll tell you we're going to have one more vote. It's going to be another trillion and a half. Are you concerned at all 
that we are going to have a debt crisis in this country over the next year, two or three years? No. Because? If you're worried about the next generation, all we have to do is sell 40-year bonds and we'll skip the next generation, Frank. Okay, but interest rates are low. Think, just think 20 to 1. The interest on $1 trillion in 1981 interest rates is equivalent to the interest on 20 trillion today. 20 trillion. And you can, if Argentina could sell 100 year debt, I promise you the United States can sell 100 year debt. And we underestimate what a country that affords freedom to people is worth. How much would a person pay just to be able to come and live in the United States? So, it's the social capital and fabric we need to protect right now. Now, two more, and this is from a friend of yours, um, from Neilan Youngblood. How does an independently owned restaurant in South LA compete with well-funded restaurants that provide healthcare? How does a small business in the inner city compete with these expensive malls? It, it's, Great to say we got to get capital into the underserved communities, but how do we actually do it? Frank, myself, and millions of other Americans are looking forward to the day I can go to that restaurant in the inner city. Okay, understanding that that person's success is dependent on our democracy. And so I... I just see a whole different understanding of the importance of those small businesses in those parts of town. And Mike, last question, what you said eight weeks ago, it all came true. I didn't agree with you. I smiled, but I'm thinking to myself, I don't see it. Why did you see it? And don't be humble. I'm asking you to be real as the last question. What allows you to see what none of else, none of the rest of us see? I believe what allows you to be able to see the future so clearly. There is no other alternative, Frank. When you ask Americans what the American dream is, it's freedom to live your life. We are being challenged on freedom to live our life. World War II was a challenge to our way of life and the country and people responded. This virus and the events in Minneapolis are an attack on our very being as to what we stand for. So we all have to respond. And, and uh, my view is AI, Frank, what does it tell us? It tells us what we think is going to happen. Now, what is the job of individuals? The job of individuals is to make sure it doesn't happen. In a financial sense, all the airlines and Lockheed and Boeing were on the verge of bankruptcy in the early 70s, late 60s. It didn't happen. We found a way to finance them and bridge them. We are finding a way to bridge companies today to the other side here. So to me, that is our challenge. AI can tell us how many people might get the virus. What's the results of the virus? But you have an antiviral cocktail to give people. They're not going to die and they're not going to the hospital. So to me, you have to assume that Every individual, someone is making the decision that they're going to change the course of history. My life was changed by the Watts riots. I made that decision. I went and saw what was happening and met a young African-American man, and it turned my world upside down. I never thought, it didn't even occur to me that someone wouldn't loan you money because of the color of your skin. But that's what he told me. The world for most Americans has been turned upside down. A policeman put his knee and killed a man 
when everyone else was standing by and watching. And it's turned our world upside down forever. And what are we going to do about it? A virus has come here and it's turned our world upside down. Okay, are we going to let it stop us? No, we're going to find out what we're going to do about it to deal with this crisis. And so to me, most people don't see it because they assumed what should happen will happen. And there's too many people, and in this country, and it's freedom, that are not going to stand by and let it happen. And that's why I am optimistic, and that's why I see a solution medically, and that's we're not going to go back to a lockdown. Now, it's easy for everyone to tell you now, well, okay, things are better, but it's going to be terrible in October. And I, and I can tell you right now, hundreds of thousands of people working in the bioscience industry are going to make sure it's not terrible in October. Mike, I don't know what to say. Frank, when you and I, and you're depressed because you do a poll and you tell me this is what people think, they don't believe in the American dream anymore. They don't believe in these ideals anymore. What do I tell you? I tell you, well, then your job, Frank, is to change the course of history. You're a great communicator. Figure out how to communicate. And that is what the stock market is and the bond market is. And that is what bioscience is. And what we've seen is unacceptable. It is not America. And we're going to change. Well, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for what you've done. We're grateful for what you've achieved. We're grateful for the hour and seven minutes that you gave us. I'm grateful for my life. Mike, stay healthy, stay safe. And everyone on this call, do something. Do something. Mentor, donate, but make a difference. Everyone, thank you very much for the call. Mike, have a great weekend. Thank you, Frank.